Please stand in honor of the family. On behalf of the family, thank you for being here. I, I know just your presence is making a big difference to them today and a part of God's way of comforting even this family. You may be seated. At this time, I'm going to turn this part of the service over to the honor guard, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning thankful for the life you gave, Brother Bob Wright. And uh, Lord, in every way, we want to honor you. That's our desire, even as I know he desired to honor you with his life as well. So help us in what we have to communicate. Lord, I pray that it might be a special blessing to his dear wife and family. And uh, Lord, an honoring to you. I pray for anyone here that uh, would need to be saved. I pray they'd hear a clear presentation of the gospel that Brother Bob was privileged to hear so many years ago. I look forward to sharing some of his stories, Lord, that might capture the essence of the man that we loved. And pray that um, you might use it to inspire us as a new generation serving you. Thank you for the honor guard that was here today. Lord, thank you for his role as a police officer here in Oklahoma City. And uh, Lord, thank you for the military honors also that will be uh, given at the graveside. Thank you for his service, Lord, as a veteran, as a, as a man serving his country. But we thank you for his service to you, dear God, as well, of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wanneker family is going to sing it this time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. Oh. 
sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace. Bob Wright was born in Weatherford, Oklahoma. February 13th, 1936, to Joel Warren Wright and Ruby Smith Wright. Loved spending his summers on his relatives' farms near Binger and Anadarko. Graduated from Capitol Hill High School in 1955, where he played football under Coach C.B. Spiegel. 1957, joined the U.S. Army, served in Korea for 18 months, honorably discharged in 1959. <clears throat> he met his wife, Jean Allen, at Cattleman's Restaurant in Oklahoma City. This is a true Oklahoma love story right there. <laughs> Cattleman's in January of 1960. <clears throat> she invited him to attend Southwest Baptist Church. And he gave this testimony, these people have something I don't have, joy and hope. After hearing the gospel, he met with Pastor O.E. Matthews on a Saturday afternoon, which time he prayed gave his life to Jesus Christ, February 14th, 1960. And then Bob and Jean were married in April of 1960, together raised three children. After working at Wilson Meatpacking Company for a few years, Bob joined the Oklahoma City Police Department in 1963. Worked his way through driving scout car, then the homicide division, detective division, finally earning the rank of lieutenant in the headquarters communication division. Retired in 1988. Then went to work security at Friendly National Bank and Chase Bank and as a courier for Fox Building Supply. Worked many side jobs while uh, a police officer Learned to do electrical work, mechanical, carpentry work. Enjoyed woodworking, woodworking, building furniture, gardening, and of course serving here at Southwest Baptist Church as a bus driver, a greeter, and an usher. Preceding him in death are his parents and siblings and their spouses, Burl and Maxine Blakemore, Joe Jr. and Darling Wright, Ann and Bill Clayton. Leaves behind his wife of almost 64 years, Jeannie, that's his nickname for her. His son, Daryl Wright, and wife, Melanie, daughter of Kelly Owen and husband, David. Daughter, Susan Odell and husband, James. Grandchildren, Hannah Schmutzler and husband, Cameron. Seth Wright, and wife, Ashley. Abrianna Williams, J.C. Donnelly and husband, Sherrod. Kirk Odell, six great-grandsons, Isaac, Benjamin, and Joshua Schmutzler. Callum and Ezra Wright, Titus Williams, also survived by many extended family, including his close nephew, Joe Bob Wright, and of course, his loving church family here at Southwest Baptist. I'd like to say that Bob was probably one of the kindest men you'll ever meet, always kind, always helpful. He was a big encourager to preachers and teachers. He was part of uh, the Sunday school class I'm privileged to teach here in the auditorium. Always a kind word, very encouraging on the way out. And he encouraged our pastor. He was that kind of person. My two oldest children once upon a time had a mowing business. And I think Bob Wright kept their mowers running many, many, many times. He was a police supporter. When my third son got on the police force a few years ago, he was his biggest supporter. Very encouraging, and my son got very attached to him through that process. And I will say this, Brother Bob will be greatly missed, for sure, but aren't you glad to know that he's in heaven with the Lord today? What a man. We'll miss him. At this time, we'll have video.
I want to thank God for all those memories, and um, and I think that really captured a good part and essence of uh, Brother Bob's life. And I think we're all agree in agreement here that we're very privileged to get to know him. Um, I'm going to share some thoughts today out of his favorite two verses. In fact, I have his uh, Bible here that uh, if you took a close look at it, you could see that it's a well-worn Bible, a lot of notes um, made throughout. And uh, so I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. And really what uh, Brother Ted shared with you just a moment ago in, in the obituary reading, I'd like just to try to paint a picture. There's a lot of people that could come up here and give a testimony about Brother Bob. So I feel quite blessed to get to speak on behalf of the family and on behalf of others. And and, uh, and to have been his pastor is a great joy for sure for me personally. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 9 and 10, he says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come, Jesus says, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. They might have life and have it more abundantly. The year is uh, 1960, January specifically of 1960, a young 24-year-old young man uh, who was really in many ways living a pretty rough life. In fact, some of those pictures there, you can just see he's a tough young man. You just you could see it. Um, so living a pretty rough life. I learned a few things even yesterday visiting with Miss Jean and and family. Um, prone to fight. In fact, uh, he didn't like the arrangement of his teeth, and uh, he was actually getting into fights, hoping that somebody would knock him out so that he could get a new arrangement. The only problem was is he just kept winning, never lost. So, so that that's the young man that walked in, age twenty four. Uh, to Cattleman's on a Saturday evening where a young lady uh, who worked only one evening a week was the hostess helping people to get seated. And Brother Bob instantly asked Miss Jean out on a date. And she said that she would. He said he'd take her anywhere she'd want to go. Where do you want to go? I'll take you anywhere. And she said, I'd like to go to Southwest Baptist Church. He said something, I'm sure, to the effect of, you're kidding me, Southwest Baptist Church? So the very next day, this is where they came. And they came for the next several Sundays. So, I mean, that was one date that led to another date. It just had to be on Sundays and in church. And in the process of that, he heard the gospel, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he died for sinners. And so as you heard a moment ago on February the 14th, 1960, O.E. Matthews, who was pastor here at that time, had the privilege to lead him to Christ. So they met in January. He was saved in February. They married in April. And life was moving ahead. He began to grow spiritually, and, and God used him uh, here in, in his life. Um, good example, great example, I believe, in terms of a husband and wife combination. I mean, we saw it in the pictures, and if you've known him any length of time, you've seen them just faithfully serving the Lord together, loving the family and loving each other. Miss Jean, uh, we thank God for you and... And uh, thank God for your example and your love for your husband and uh, faithfulness, encouragement to him. And it's evident that he loved you as well. I thank God for his love for his kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. In fact, uh, Isaac, who uh, they're watching by live stream today from Mongolia, called him Great Big Grandpa. And I think that kind of fits him, you know, big hands and big-bodied man. It's pretty good. Um, he had quite, in many ways, uh, what could be perceived, perceived as an intimidating look. It was stern. In fact, I think um, Brother David Owen could attest to this as he went to talk to Brother Bob about Kelly, and I'm sure others could too. I just heard a story about you, Brother David, and I didn't ask you for permission, but it's too late to do that now, but... Uh, so, Brother Bob, or sorry, David was walking up the driveway, Brother Bob was working on a car, and he looked out from under the hood, and that 1960, or whatever year it was, 70s, I'm off on my years, but <laughs> uh, flat top, and then that stern look that only a father can give 
But they became very close, and I'm thankful, of course, for that. He worked hard. He was a very intense man, very honest. Uh, one thing that came up several times is just how much he valued honesty. And, uh, boy, that's um, a very important trait at all times, indeed, in our day and time as well. Daryl mentioned how that he got to go with him all kinds of places, even on uh, work jobs as he do some electrical work and working on houses and he was small and as a kid and Brother Bob would put him in the crawl spaces under the house and uh, take advantage of that opportunity and but then also going hunting and down in the southeast part of Oklahoma and thinking maybe they were lost but dad knew where they were at all times all dads do right and Took it, taking him rather to headquarters and letting him be a part of the dispatch in the sense of they get the phone call in and the call in and write down on the card and then it going out. So that's really something to remember. I'm, I'm sure thankful for the honor guard that's here today uh, to represent this part of Brother Bob's life, his service here in Oklahoma City as a police officer. And one of my favorite memories. Um but not really too long ago. <laughs> so I watched him out in the foyer and all these young police officers and, and others uh, that have served even a long time in the police force, but members of this church, but they just were kind of huddled around by the Bob. And as the age of, of wisdom was speaking to them, it just captured something with me that he was trying to pass something on to them. And he loved his work as a police officer. And I have no idea as to what kind of pressures are there. I mean, I, I would imagine that there are just an incredible amount, but, but he kind of took on that role of trying to help young officers and talking to them about the pressures and the temptations and encouraging them to be honest and to do right. Well, from 1963 to 1988, he served as a police officer in this city and Kind of a different day and time as he came into it. This is interesting to me. I thought it would be to you as well that at that time you had to purchase your own uniform and, and uh, your own firearm and bullets. Well, he had financial means to purchase the uniform and the gun, but he had to borrow the bullets. But it worked out and he served in that capacity those years. Covering an area, and in fact, if I understand right, uh, he went basically from civilian to officer because they didn't have an academy at that time, and so you just trained under another officer. And But he covered from Western, West, and 44th Street, South. So this quadrant, and I realize a lot of it now that is uh, houses and businesses was rural, but that's a lot of area, a lot of responsibility that he covered. And uh, his first police car was a, a Dodge Dart. And... Uh, Kind of a unique uh, arrangement there, and uh, not where the officers divided from the one arrested. So at one time, uh, his partner was in the back with the lady that they had arrested, and he called out, Bob, she's biting me. And he said, well, pull her hair. <laughs> and he pulled her hair, and it was a wig. <laughs> so <laughs> that one didn't work, but... <laughs> I love it. Can you imagine the stories that just uh, went on like that? <laughs> he loved the Lord. He loved Southwest Baptist Church. He grew as a Christian here. Um, men like Don Fox had a big impact on his life. I heard that firsthand from Brother Bob that Brother, Don, Brother Don's in heaven now, Miss Melba, sweet couple. He was a deacon at this church. He uh, but way before our time here on Sunday afternoons at five o'clock would teach a training union and men and others would come and, and uh, that had a huge impact on your dad's life and, and he, he had a great admiration, respect for Don Fox and I, I just have in my mind I think it was the case that really Don just kind of took him under his wing and they became close family friends and he mentored them and took trips together down to to their house, even in Hollis, but of course here in Oklahoma City too, and and uh, just they served the Lord together. And in fact, Brother Don's son Jim said about him, he said, "Dad liked Brother Bob because he was the real deal, just a real man." Uh, the young men that are here as pallbearers today, their lives are impacted by Brother Bob, and I think a lot of it. Started because there was a man like a Don Fox who invested in him and he passed it on to others. 
He, uh, he loved Bible preaching. He loved Bible preaching. As Brother Ted mentioned, um, he would often say, um, he'd come out in the foyer and he'd, he'd uh, just take, just clear off a spot. It wasn't every Sunday or anything like that, but it was certain times he'd come and say, Brother Gaddis, thank you for preaching. We, we need that kind of preaching. You know, he'd say with fervency, we need it. We need it. Don't back down. Well, what are you going to say to Brother Bob except, yes, sir? <laughs> Definitely. He had a passion to restore on, on the handout that you received today about his life. Miss Kelly wrote this about her dad. I'd like to just highlight a few things. I think it does a, a great honor to, to their dad. One of Brother Bob's passions in life was the desire to fix and restore things. Some of the pictures we saw captured that. To bring them back to how they once were. And to return them to the original design and usefulness, whether it was an old rusty tool um, or a sputtering lawnmower <laughs> engine dilapidated building or a plot of dry ground or a wayward son or a fellow human being. He was always in the business of restoring and repairing and renovating. Some of the ways he did that was cleaning and bringing back to order old tools and mechanical things. In fact, not long ago, we had a theme at Heartland Baptist Bible College about to keep the plow on the ground. And uh, Brother Seth uh, remembered that he had a plow at the house. So that was, uh, we use that and, and still we use it to teach others and but crafting furniture out of old lumber or wooden pallets and cultivating a huge garden out of the hard red Oklahoma soil, praying fervently for his children and grandchildren during tough times, counseling young officers and helping them stay on the right track, driving a church bus filled with children and Bible college students that are going out door knocking and helping others construct a church building on the Indian reservation. That's one of the pictures I believe that we saw there and that they, a group of men from here went there and built that building in a week's time. Imagine uh, the work that they put into that. But greeting folks, and this was his his door here, greeting with Brother Fogler and and um, the ups and downs of marriage life in 64 years. It talks about here in the next paragraph about the um, the disease that that he had here at the end of his life. And I remember out in the foyer him telling me, now, Brother Gaddis, here's what's going to happen. They tell me according to this disease. I'm going to begin to lose the ability to control the muscle system and all that. And he just kind of walked me through what it was going to be like up to this time. Very resolute. Matter of fact, um, not whining or complaining, but still trusting God. But just let me know what was going to go on. And, and you know, folks, we live in a fallen world and we live in these fallen bodies in the sense affected by the curse of sin. And so all of us are going to come to that time one way or the other. There was a passion to rebuild, and that's what made him a good police officer. It goes on in the fourth paragraph down there, roughly. It wasn't just because he enjoyed arresting people or accusing people or exposing the wrong. He knew that it was, it was, uh, he knew what it was like to be made fun of and for your looks or to struggle in school, to experience limitations of poverty and watch others suffer to lose your dad as a young man, to run the streets trying to find fulfillment and purpose. As a result, he wanted to help restore people and took his job very seriously. The most important reason that he had a passion to restore came on that day of his salvation, that day when he realized that before God, he was a broken sinner, incapable of restoring himself. He came to understand that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, came to be his Savior, dying on the cross, shedding his blood as a cure for the sinful mankind. That day, Bob humbled himself and called on Jesus to save his soul. That one decision changed his life forever. Not only was he now free from sin and its punishment, but was free to pursue a relationship with the Lord that allowed him to be a part of God's overarching plan of redemption. He can now partner with God in the restoration of created things and created people to help them become what God originally intended them to be. Here's a quote from, in fact, I uh, got to look through his notebook, and he wrote this down. The importance and meaning of life is not who we are, but what we do with what we've been given by God. That's quite a statement. Bob was 
ever proud of his children, grandchildren, and followed his path by becoming restorers as well. Engineer, teacher, accountant, church secretary, missionary, doctor, architect, computer tech, husband, wife, mom, dad, and grandparent. Bob Wright was a strong man, a tough man's man. But his true strength was not in himself. Our most glorious moments are when we are most like God. Bob Wright lived a life that glorified his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because like God, he set out to passionately help restore and strengthen others. His memory and the impact of his life on others will not be forgotten. And that's really what we're remembering here today. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, I love this, if any man. That means this, any individual. You might be here this morning and say, you know, I'm, I'm beyond what God can do. I, I, he can't fix my life. He can't fix me. No, the Bible says any man. I am the door. A few years back, we were uh, blessed to go to, uh, in Arkansas, there's the Passion Play, but they also have the, the Holy Lands, uh, the replica of the tabernacle and such, but they had a, a shepherd's fold. And I didn't understand this, but at the opening of the shepherd's folds is an opening, maybe about as wide as this pulpit, probably a little bit more uh, wide than that. But then it clicked that the shepherd would sit in that door. And the sheep, if they're going to come into the fold, they had to come in by the shepherd. And then the shepherd would lead them out. And he, that's why Jesus said, I am the door. If any man enter by me, that's, that's what he's saying. And so today, I, I know Brother Bob would want me to say to you, listen, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's commandments. We've trespassed against the God who created us and who loves us. And you know that day when Bob Wright, as a 20-something-year-old, walked in at Cattleman's, he had no idea how his life was about to change. <laughs> oh, it changed because he met G Gene Allen at that time. No doubt that changed his life for the good. But through Miss Jean, he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus changed his life forever. In particular, he really liked this part of the verse, he shall, where it says, he shall go in and out and find pasture. In and out. Um, as I studied that here just briefly for this, this service, it, it basically communicates this. Not only does he save you, but he has an ongoing relationship with you. In and out. The ends of the up, can I say it this way? The ups and downs of life that the shepherd never once leaves you. He shall find pasture. Oh, the thief, the enemy of God, Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I am come that they might have life. Might have life. That would speak of the eternal life that's in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that'd be you today, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. O.E. Matthews opened up his Bible and explained to Bob Wright, Bob, you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. But here's the good news. This is why well, it's called the gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news is this. Jesus paid that price on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And was buried, and thank God for this, he rose again. And he's able to save anyone because the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that day on February the 14th, how about that? What a day to get saved, right? Trust Jesus as your Savior. The day after his birthday, if I remember that right. Uh, well, there it is. You had to have a physical birth, right, to be here. But to go to heaven, you got to have a second birth, Jesus said. So he's born physically February the 13th. He was born again February the 14th, born in God's family. And today he's in the Lord's presence, free from suffering, not feeble, able to move about. How about you today? Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Have you trusted him personally? If not, let me encourage you to enter in by 
the door, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope you have for salvation. It's not in yourself. It's not in trying harder, joining a church, doing any religious acts. It's not in any of those things. It's in trusting who Jesus is and trusting what he did. In fact, I'd like to close with this. I was just opening up um, the Bob's Bible to John uh, chapter number 10, and I found this written actually on the page opposite of the first page of John's gospel, chapter 1. So it's written at the bottom of Luke, but it says this, this the, and Brother Bob writes this. By the way, he has very nice handwriting. Just a little side note, I was very impressed. Um, it says this, my salvation is guaranteed, not by what I have done, but what, by what he has already done. And then, then he has out to the side, whosoever will accept God's forgiveness for the past. I'm sure thankful today that that's exactly what Brother Bob did. He accepted God's forgiveness for the past, trusted him as a savior. Does that mean he lived the rest of his time without sin? Oh, no, no, we still sin, but it doesn't change the fact that we're in God's family. He loves us and helps us to have a relationship with him. And he went in and out and found pastor. In fact, Bob Wright had life, but he had it more abundantly through the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you today. We've taken these moments to try to capture the life and legacy of Bob Wright. And I thank you for him sincerely. Best I know how, dear God, I just thank you for him and Miss Jean. And I do pray for anyone here today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that even now while I'm praying that they would acknowledge that they're a sinner and that there's nothing they could do to save themselves and ask you to save them based on what you did at Mount Calvary and verified by your resurrection from the dead. I thank you, God, for the hope we have as believers. And I pray that anyone here that doesn't have that would accept you even now. Comfort the family. Thank you for these many friends who have taken of their day to be here to honor this family and to be a help and a source of comfort. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
his face and thank him for his saving grace. When I stand in the presence of the Lord. Shepherd, do not leave me. I need your eyes to find my way. Gentle Shepherd, do not leave me. I need your feet that I may. In your pasture, there is manna for my hungry, thirsty soul.
Don't feel sorry for me When you see I'm in need There's a judge who grants mercy and love All my burdens he lifts All my sin he forgives Every trial is one Justified, satisfied, oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. In the cross, in the cross. Be upon his 
his face and thank him for his saving grace.